Hi everyone, welcome back to my channel and you're watching The Brown Feminist. Last week I posted a poll and you guys chose two out of the three videos that you wanted me to focus on in the next coming weeks. And one of them was, what exactly does a study monitor do? So what are we waiting for? Let's get into it. So the term study monitor might show up on a lot of your job searches and a lot of people don't really understand what it means. In the case of a typical pharmaceutical company or CRO, the term study monitor can mean exactly the same as the title CRA or clinical research associate. A lot of clinical research associate perform the functions of a study monitor. So when you're doing your job searches, make sure you're searching for both. You don't want to miss out on any jobs just because you use one designation instead of another. Essentially, a clinical research associate who works as a study monitor can do it in two levels. But today we'll talk about more of the entry level or mid-tier level of work when you're doing it as a study monitor and not as a central monitor, which is like a much more senior role, okay? So this like general entry to mid-level study monitor is somebody who works for a pharma company or for a pharma company, but through a CRO, a contract research organization, and the primary role that they perform is to monitor and support the quality of studies being done, the quality of data being collected through clinical trials at a site. By site, we typically mean hospital environments or clinics, research institutes where different studies and clinical trials are being performed on human subjects. Now, all different kinds of studies can have study monitors, even if it's not a drug trial, even if it's not a regulated study. But it is less important and less common because study monitoring is, you know, it takes a lot of time and therefore it takes a lot of money. It takes human resources and man hours. Um, so usually smaller studies and lower risk studies don't have the same kind of budget for monitoring. But if you're working for a drug trial where you're actually using like phase two or phase one or phase three trials on actual human subjects, of course, these are considered higher risk, especially because these drugs are not yet in the market. Their side effects may not be known. You're actually experimenting on live humans who could experience any kind of unknown side effects from them. As a result, these are the studies where we see the role study monitors being used the most often. So many of the other roles where maybe you have people just collecting data from patients from across sites, you might have a little bit of internal monitoring, but you don't usually have a dedicated study monitor that goes from site to site reviewing different charts and making sure things are okay. So let's come to the main question and we'll answer it in three different parts. What does a study monitor really do? So study monitor performs a variety of functions. For the part one, we're going to talk about site selection and study initiation. So for site selection, once you're a study monitor and you're hired at this pharma or CRO, you want to find out which sites would be good to be selected as sites to implement your study at. So for example, let's say you have a new drug that's going to help people with stage two of colon cancer just as an example, or a stage two of thyroid cancer. So what would be a good site for a study monitor? As a monitor, you wanna find out like clinics or hospitals that have an oncology department where you deal with cancer patients, right? You can't go to like an ortho unit or like a foot care clinic to find these kind of patients. The most relevant patients would be coming into like a hospital or a clinic that deals with people with these cancer kind of, you know, uh, conditions or diagnosis. Second thing we want to think about is what kind of resource and logistics will I need? So maybe you need to have like, you know, if you're trying to do a drug trial, it's less commonly done through clinics unless it's like a super easy pill. You just dispense it to the patient and they take it home. Maybe it's a little bit more critical. Maybe it's like an IV med. So the patients have to come in 
and they have to have a full setup with like a nurse and a physician who have to sit there and the pharmacy is going to dispense the drug. In that case, maybe your site selection tells you, okay, let's go with the hospital, which has like an ER if anything goes wrong and which has like all this set up for like an IV and an exam room and like all of these resources. The third thing you're looking at is of course, who are you gonna do this study through? Are there oncologists? Are there oncologists who are even interested in this study? So all of these studies at the site level are going to require an investigator. And in Canada and the US, almost always the investigator for a drug trial has to be an MD who, who happens to be a specialist in the field where you're doing your drug trial. So in this case, it would be an MD who's like maybe, you know, a senior um, attending in oncology or something like that. And they're open to doing you know, they have enough patients coming through them and it might benefit their patients and they see the kind of patient. So for example, if your trial is being done on adults, then obviously you don't want to go to a pediatric oncologist or your uh, medication is being tested for thyroid cancer. Then of course you don't want to go to like a, you know, an, an oncologist who specializes in like bloodborne cancers or leukemias. You want to go to maybe somebody who specializes in like solid tumors or thyroid cancers or like specific so you want to have as much overlap with the interest of that pi or that investigator um with what you're trying to achieve in the population you're trying to achieve usually you don't just approach one side you might you know send it out to a team maybe that investigator works closely with other investigators as well so you might want to onboard one of them as an investigator and the others as a co-investigator you wanna see if this site has ever done research studies. Do they have a local research ethics board? So there's all of this research that you need to do and all of this relationship building and community building that you have to do as a study monitor before you can select a site. A lot of the times when you have experience, you'll be like, oh, you know what? I've worked with you in the past and it was so great. We were able to achieve so much together for this patient population. We have a new drug coming on. Can I come have a chat with you one of these days? Or can I email over a questionnaire and see if this would be a good fit? So usually, um, depending on how secretive the pharma company is, they might send over like an NDA before sharing anything about the drug. Or if they're like not so worried with competitors, they might just send the PI like a small sl slide deck with a brief summary of what is the drug based on. Maybe it's an antibody based immunotherapeutic or maybe it's something that's just specifically targeting um, like one aspect of these cancer patients, like maybe a symptomatic management, maybe it's not fully targeting the cancer, or maybe it's like an oncolytic therapy that's like a virus that's going to go in and try to destroy um, any kind of remnants of the cancer after surgery. So it can be a variety of things. And depending on that, you'll have to let the PI know and see if it's something they believe in. Because PIs, like, yes, they, this is an opportunity for them to, you know, get some funds in from pharma to sometimes support their growing research teams, but at the end of the day, their priority is patient's health and their priority is to give an opportunity to their patient population to access a certain trial that maybe, you know, that drug might not come to the market for another five years, but some people might not have that long if they're maybe like, you know, going through something time sensitive in terms of a treatment. So this is an opportunity for the patients to get an early treatment um, available they might be in a placebo group, they might not, but it might be a shot and it might be something that works. So the PI really needs to like buy into it and like have some faith in the product that you're selling. So the PI usually will go through the protocol and will look at kind of summary of past experiments done in animal models or any kind of preliminary human trials that have been done and then they'll like proceed. So a part of the study monitor's job is building that relationship, keeping that relationship ongoing for more than like one study, um, and then to identify investigators, sub-investigators, co-investigators, as well as good study sites. Um, and then knowing like, you know, okay, I'm gonna do it at this Toronto General Hospital. I'm gonna do it at the Montreal General Hospital. I know that they don't have this division or their division in this is very limited or they don't like doing blood work for us. So you need to then think about all of the logistics. A lot of the times the clinical research coordinators will also be looped into the process as the PI is making the decisions because the coordinators will know a lot of the logistics that are needed. Like, do we have the capacity to do like 24 hour recruitment of patients? Do we have enough staff to do that? Or do we have like 
enough nurses on staff to do these long six hour long IV infusion drugs? What happens if there's an infusion reaction? Do we have that setting available? Do we have pharmacy um, being able to take on responsibility for like all of these new drugs? Um, do we have blood work, urine testing, culture and stuff on site and who's gonna pay for that? Um, and following that, as the contract gets signed, so this was your site selection, and you basically have a couple of meetings, do some paperwork, and if it's a good fit from both the site and the pharma site, then the site monitor will come in and do a site initiation visit. So suppose paperwork's been kind of signed and you know ethics is moving along, it's getting approved, then you wanna come in and as a site monitor, your job is also to kind of help identify, okay, which members of the team are gonna be really running the study day to day, because investigators will do more of like, you know, medically stuff. So they might do like, okay, confirm, this is the right diagnosis, the right patient, and then they're gonna be busy. The coordinators, the research assistants, the trial assistants, and other people at the site level are gonna take over the day-to-day. -day. So you have to probably go in and do a tour and kind of an audit of the pharmacy, meet with the pharmacist, meet with the nursing team, meet with the coordinator team, and be like, okay, are you guys licensed? Are you guys this? So there's a lot of understanding of regulatory paperwork that goes in for a study monitor because you are basically the eyes and ears of this pharma company. And if they, the pharma company messes up, then the regulatory authorities, whether it's like the FDA in the US or Health Canada in Canada, um, they can be like, you know what, you didn't follow this. So, so all the data you got through this trial is null and void because you never did this. These people were not even trained to do that or they weren't even licensed to do that. So a lot of the time, a study monitor will go in for their site initiation visit and SIV, and you have to make sure, you know, I'll, I'll need a copy of the license for the pharmacy. I'll need a copy for the license for the lab where these tests are gonna take place. I need to see the doctors like MD degree and relicensing or license renewals. I need to see the nurses this, I need to see the setup. So they want to visit, like, not just through paperwork, like paperwork for sure, but they also they want to go in and just make sure that, you know, everything's uh, on point and then provide some hands-on training and then explain with the team how things are going to run, when things are going to get shipped, provide access to them. So you are basically the middleman and the point of contact between that pharma implementing this study and between the site and the coordinators and the investigators at the site level who are running the study. So you are that key, key person. And the more diligent you are, the more elaborately you are doing your job at the beginning during initiation, the better it's gonna be for you long-term. Because the more time you're giving and answering people's questions at the beginning, there's gonna be less mess ups and you know less problems for you. So this was basically part one of what a study monitor does, of course, in very brief. For part two, let's talk about a study that's ongoing. It's been six months, the trial has been recruiting. Uh, you're happy with the progress, you know, budget and everything was already approved, contracts have been signed. The first 50 or first 100 patients have been recruited through this site. So you are kind of on the neck of the sites to make sure recruitment targets are being met. If you were targeting a thousand patients and you know for sure that this site has the capacity to recruit a thousand patients because 5,000 people with this condition pass through this hospital or this clinic every few months and you, you have that data from them and then you're like, oh, I'm wondering why they're not meeting eligibility criteria or are they declining more? You wanna keep an eye and make sure like, you know, things are running smoothly and stuff. Then you're doing your day-to-day -day little bits of auditing or monitoring remotely as well. You're checking in that all the data being entered from the site is being done so correctly through the EDC, the electronic data capture tool, which can be like under a lot of different names. But essentially you wanna log in, generate queries if something's not making sense. Somebody's supposed to enter a patient's weight in kilograms um, and they have like 700. And you're like, this person's like not, like either it's 70 or it's like, how many people are like 700 kilograms? Like, so you know that there's probably something wrong, the unit and this isn't making sense. And like a lot of time points aren't matching up. So even remotely, there's a lot of things you can do day to day to monitor a site to make sure things are you know going well. You wanna make sure that the kits at the site level 
um, are not expired. So you want to have that day-to-day -day communication, the weekly communication with the site level, with the coordinators, have a good relationship. Um, end of the day, yes, it's kind of your job to catch their mistakes, but not to punish them, not to embarrass them in front of their bosses, but just to, you know, make sure that it's corrected as soon as possible. Because what you're getting out of it on behalf of your pharma company is to make sure that all the data is, you know, good data integrity, clean data, accurate data, high quality data, and, you know, the work's being done. There's not a lot of protocol deviations. There's, you know, anything that's happening, like a side effect, is being reported in time. So it's a well-regulated, well-monitored study. That's what you're trying to get out of it. Then, of course, comes the biggest chunk in this part two, which is doing a study monitor's visit. So for a study monitor's visit, there's usually some travel required unless you're lucky enough to be living in the same site, same city as your site. Usually uh, drug trials happen across states, across countries. Um, so there's usually four, five, 10, 20 sites involved. It depends on how much you know, population diversity they're looking at or how easy it is to get uh, patients for a certain study. If a study has very difficult eligibility criteria, like it's for a very specific population with a rare disease condition, and you know you can only find like a two or three patients per site, then a study is uh, more likely to recruit, you know, to onboard 10 or 20 sites just to reach their target of 50 patients. Whereas if you know that this is like for common cold, and it's very common to get common colds, and you'll probably find it across so many doctors clinic for this certain drug. Then you can just do like five cities spread across the country or spread across the state and, you know, make sure you're, it's positioned in a way to get as much ethnic and age and sex diversity as you can. And you can probably do a few sites and just each site can have like 100 patients and you can get 500 patients very easily. So a lot of that goes into your site selection, but and when it comes to monitoring, it also plays into the fact that, you know, you might have to travel to another city and another country. And that's why, even though they say study monitors work remotely, there is actually quite a bit of in-person um, work and it's usually not at your office. It's usually at a different site each time. The study monitors that I have met with, they each handles 10 or 20 different studies. So anywhere between 10, 12, 15, 16, 18, 20 studies. So for each study, there might be multiple sites that they're supporting. So it can be like a very hectic job. Um, so on the day of study monitoring, usually you wanna give like advanced notice and then fix a date with a coordinator of when it's good to come in. And then you wanna do, as soon as you've started recruiting some patients, like your first five, 10 or 20 patients, you wanna come and do a study visit just to make sure you know everything's done right and fix it as early as possible. You wanna do another one maybe halfway through the time point of the study. If it's meant to be for two years, you wanna go in at the one year mark, you wanna come back in a year and a half. So usually every three months to every six months, I see a study monitor for each of my studies. Um, and once you're there, it's usually a couple of different ways that it can happen. If the site that you're working with uses paper charting, then you might wanna see you know some of those charts and see what the original crfs were where they're stored and things like that a lot of sites are now moving to emr systems so electronic medical record systems so it really depends so some of the emr systems such as epic for example that's a software where um you obviously don't want to give your personal patient full chart full information to a random person from a pharma company right because that goes against research ethics but you may be able to release some data from there to a monitor's account for a specific day or two while the study monitoring visit is happening so the last time that i was doing this i talked to my it division ahead of time and they told me exactly how to go about it um, so I selected, okay, these are the 20 patients in the study that he's going to come in and monitor for. So on the day of when he's here and he's in our Wi-Fi, our network, he's here with his laptop and I have his email and everything, I will release those patients. So the version of the EMR system that the monitor gets to see has no name, no phone number, no address, no direct patient identifiers beyond like maybe an age and sex. Um, and they have the study ID linked to it. So they'll be able to see that and they will go in and meticulously match that with what you entered into the EDC. So when you entered it into the pharmaceutical company's database and maybe you put in this patient was diagnosed on this date and this was their uh, kind of staging of cancer, maybe he's checking the file and he's like, no, this is wrong. So your source is saying it was stage four, but you wrote stage two. 
So that's like a major protocol deviation. So these are the little things, the nitty gritty things that is the job of the study monitor to really go through all of the source material, the CRFs, and the final like data entry and make sure that they are all matching up. They're all making sense. There aren't mistakes. Um, there are a lot of other little things that I can't possibly fit in a video, but I'll give you an example. So if when we had paper charts and then maybe something was wrong and you like scribble it and you rewrite the correct thing, that's like not accepted. So there's proper way of doing it. It's a single strike through line. You provide the new information up top that has been corrected and then you immediately initial and date on when it was corrected. So they have to be very auditable, very clearly done. Everything has to be paginated. A page number has to be provided. So there's all of these like, you know, good clinical practice code of conduct for study monitoring and for how to maintain study documents, whether they're electronic or they're in paper. And all of these are checked by our study monitor. Sometimes they'll come in and be like, oh, this one research coordinator on your team, um, this training of theirs has lapsed. And until they renew their training and they provide the certification on file, they can't touch a study patient anymore. They can't be involved in the study anymore. So a lot of their jobs is to make sure you're doing your job right as a clinical research coordinator. So when my study monitors come to visit, they're like, oh, you know what? That doctor has not renewed their good clinical practice. They can't be part of the study until this happens. And those things can be dangerous because if they suddenly say these three people on your team are no longer qualified to do the study until they've renewed their certifications, you might have a patient visit tomorrow and you can't do that. So like you really want to be on top of these things so they don't find the mistakes, but they will inevitably find some small mistake, um, which is fine. Like their job is to make sure mistakes are identified and then corrective measures are taken by you instead of like oh no you made a mistake they're not here to be punitive um, they're not here to find a way to like punish you and show how many mistakes you made but our goal as research coordinators at the site is to make as few mistakes as possible so our study monitoring visits go more smoothly and everything's like you know on point at the end of the day people are human everybody makes mistakes just you know finish it as soon as you can. A lot of the time study monitor visits can go more than one day. They might do like an eight hour shift one day, go back to the hotel, come again the next morning. It depends on how much paperwork there is in the trial, how many patients there are in the trial. Um, and then at the end of the study visit or even during their visit, they'll show you out small mistakes so you can correct them as you go. But if you're busy, you're not able to do that, that's fine. They will give you an end of uh, study monitoring visit summary sheet that will get emailed to you and to the PI at the site, so your boss. And they'll give you like some time, like, okay, please fix this before like next week or something like that. And they will come back and review it um, or they'll review it at their next monitoring visit. So things like that really uh, make sure that regulated studies, drug trials, are you know meticulous in the way they're recording data, in the way they're just going about every step of the trial process. And this is a big chunk of what study monitors do. So now comes to the third part and that is the study closeout visit. So just like the study initiation visit, the study closeout visit is also very important. This is the final chance that a study monitor has to come in and review everything to do with the study, the time of the study has done, maybe the target recruitment has been reached all across the site or at your site and you know it's time to wrap things up. So in this last visit they will once again go through everything from any sample that was missing ever, any patient's data which like stopped, the patient stopped coming after like visit four but you didn't document that the patient wanted to withdraw. So you can't just like stop recording data after fourth visit so he has to find or she has to find all of these nitty gritty things and make sure everything is properly documented. If a patient dropped out of the study, there needs to be a document saying they dropped out of the study. This many attempts was made to communicate with them by phone or email or whatever and they couldn't be reached or they picked up the phone and they said they no longer want to participate in the study for so and so reason. So it has to be a withdrawal. Um, and then it has to be dated accordingly and then it has to be a note to file, right? So anything like that that has already taken place in the study but is not properly documented has to be fixed in this last stage. Once study closure happens up, like that's it, the trial master's file is going to be closed. They want to go to pharmacy. They want to make sure that all the medication that wasn't used up is being disposed of 
and the pharmacy record books are like you know reconciling how many were received and how many are being discarded and what way they're being discarded and all of that stuff they want to make sure and review all the licenses and records and make sure everybody was trained and was licensed throughout the study period all the crfs are complete all the queries on your online database the edc where you were entering the data for the pharma company they have been entered and answered and corrected so this is like their last chance to make sure everything is done properly before they close out and then any remaining invoices are paid off so the study monitor also makes sure that the budget is like being honored by both sides because sometimes they might have something in the budget which says you know we'll pay you if these additional tests are done but maybe you didn't do the additional tests and you still like accidentally charge them in the invoice to give you that extra thousand dollars and then they might come and be like sorry this patient actually did not have this test done or this test was actually done for a standard of care it wasn't done specifically for the study so it doesn't fall under the budget so they have to be meticulous in every aspect of the study including like invoicing and finances to reviewing what was done and not done reviewing things that were done in a timely manner if ever you are not able to do a patient visit or a patient follow-up within the study window then they'll be like okay why was this more than two days late when you have like a clear plus two minus two allowed date in the protocol so you might say you know hospital was closed for 15 days for a fire or construction or the patient refused to come or this happened then usually you would need to show that you communicate this to the pi you've communicated this to the patient that you are coming in beyond the study window you have to go back to the pharma and say this patient study window has been missed should we still go ahead and give the drug at four days past the date and how is that going to affect the next drug date and the next drug date so you have to have all of this stuff like documented so having good documentation skills and communication skills is super important at the site and that will help the the monitor that will help you that will help the study because end of the day, everybody's goal in this whole process is to make sure that the study is able to generate good data to show whether a drug is working or not working, has side effect, doesn't have side effect, what it's achieving, how the patient outcomes are. The end of the day, it's to fight a disease, it's to help a patient, it's to do good for humanity, it's to do good for, you know, the world of health sciences. So that's basically the role of a study monitor i'm sure they do a lot of extra things but these are some of the more key things the most important monitoring purposes now it's important that the study monitor is not a part of the team sometimes some sites let people from other teams monitor studies this is not done for pharma sponsored drug trials usually pharma sponsored means the pharma will send their own monitor over but for investigator initiated studies, you can do internal monitoring, but of course you can't monitor your own work. You can't review your own work. You can have somebody from another team or another department of the hospital and monitor each other's work. And of course, how much monitoring is needed, like I was telling you at the beginning of this video, is based on a risk status. So the more risk it brings to people and people's lives, the more monitoring hours will usually be needed. If it's a study where you are doing retrospective chart auditing, so you're going through patients charts from the last 10 years, taking out data, putting it into a database and analyzing, okay, how many people that came through this hospital had this outcome after this drug? So nobody is likely to get hurt. This study might still need some monitoring because some data may be incorrectly extracted and entered. Even though this study might need monitoring because you're you know, extracting data, entering data, there might be mistakes, there might be a little auditing needed, it can improve the quality. But not doing a lot of monitoring for this will not, you know, risk somebody's life. Whereas if it's like an intervention driven, it's a drug, it's a surgical procedure, it's something else, it's a diagnostic tool, there might be, you know, more greater harms or outcomes um, because of a lack of monitoring. So that's usually how people allocate funds and time resources and man hours to how much study monitoring is needed. So I hope this video has been able to give you guys a good idea of what study monitoring is like and essentially clinical research associates from pharma, especially more junior roles, do a lot of this travel and a lot of this study monitoring. As you go up, you might be able to do it a lot more centrally. There are places where they do remote monitoring. They don't always come to site. It really depends on a lot of different factors. But I hope this video has been helpful to you guys and have a wonderful day. Bye. Hey guys, 
Before you go, don't forget that I do offer one-on-one -on -one career counseling services in clinical research. So if you do feel that beyond the videos and the emails where I answer all of your questions, you need a little bit more of hands-on support. You're not getting those interviews and you're not really sure why, or you just don't know how to handle certain questions because of your, you know, you don't have all the experiences, but you know that you can do the job. If you need some additional help in resume building, cover letter design, interview prep, or just general career consultations, I do offer this service now live find out more by clicking the link below i have a whole video where i explain what services i offer and there is a form there if you would like to sign up until next time this was the brown feminist bye